Hello everybody, I'm Pastor Steve Green. This is Brighton Word of Faith Church, Sunday, June 14th, 2020. We're glad to have you with us today. Thank you very much. We trust that today will be a very profitable day for you. And uh, our subject, first of all, our theme, the theme that we've been following is boundaries, a key to godly and healthy relationships. And our subject for today is the gospel is the power of God. And in previous Sundays, we've uh, discussed um, more about the boundaries, my property, another person's boundary, my responsibility, their responsibility, interfering, not interfering, blaming, not blaming. Today, not so much about those things. It's going to be more about focusing directly in on my territory, not so much concerned about the neighboring territory, but just focusing on what it is that God has given to me to do, what he's given to you to do, what our responsibilities are. Where we left off last week, we were talking about how in each verse of the New Testament, literally Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, all the way through to Revelation, each book of the New Testament emphasizes that there is one basic responsibility that you and I have. Not only do we have that one basic responsibility, but if we'll do it, then we are assured, we are promised by God that things will go well for us. We will love life and see good days. And that one responsibility is that we would love one another. And that love is a supernatural kind of love. It's empowered, it's empowered by the dunamis power of God. It's not natural. It's not natural love. There are many examples of natural love around us and not taking away from that, but this is something different, something higher. It is supernatural love. It is, uh, as we said, empowered love. It is, it's empowered through faith uh, and it is something that is what God is. It's how He loves. And if we'll do that one thing, if we'll learn how to yield to the Holy Spirit, yield, have faith, do it as God would have us do it, then we will be assured of a good result. We will have our responsibility. We'll be fulfilling our responsibility. We'll see results now and in eternity. We'll hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So this is the focal point. This is what we're doing. And we were looking at several, last week as we finished, we were looking at several different books of the New Testament, just seeing briefly in each one, not certainly not all 27, but we were looking at a few at how this message was in the New Testament books. Now today what we're going to do is continue to focus in on our responsibility because again, if that's all we know, if it's all we do, we may not even be that aware of boundaries. I think it's good to be aware of boundaries, but even if we're not, if all we're doing is focusing on what falls within our boundary, uh, then uh, we're going to be successful. Uh, thank the Lord. Praise God. And so, uh, today we're going to look at Romans, and in particular, uh, what Paul teaches in Romans about this subject, and we'll see it in more detail. Uh, instead of looking across several books, we'll be going into more detail in one book, and I'll need your attention. I'll need you to focus, because we're going to be following a series of steps. It'll be like climbing a stairway, one step after another, and each step is important to understanding the whole, and so um, we'll get to that here in just a minute. But before we go any further, I want to uh, remind you about offerings you may wish to give. The way that most people give is through email money transfer, and our address for that is donation at bwofc.com. Also on our website at bwofc.com, there is a, um, a donate button you can uh, click on and give by credit card if that's another way that you would like to give. Uh, also, we want to remind everybody about our refresh messages. Those are usually three times a week, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. They're about five minutes each, and what they are is refreshing a key point from Sunday's message to help uh, keep it top of mind so that we can do it and obtain the benefit of doing it. Uh, we want you, uh, if you wish, to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you uh, to that. We want to uh, say... Uh, a special thank you to those that are uh, subscribers. Thank, we we <clears throat> appreciate it, and uh, we'd like you to like us on our Facebook 
page and to share this broadcast on Facebook. And for those that are wishing to be physically present, which we think is an improvement, they say absence makes the heart grow fonder. But uh, as one person said, presence is an improvement. And we, we thank you for joining us uh, online on YouTube. And if you can be with us, again, that is even better. And here's some of the things that we're doing. Uh, we're disinfecting uh, commonly touched purposes. We have hand sanitizer. We have face masks, uh, if you wish. Uh, we ask a couple of things, is that everybody observe physical distancing. And also, if anybody's not feeling well, we would love to have you with us, but please uh, enjoy the broadcast at home until you're feeling better. All right, <clears throat> uh, let's pray for a moment. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, the eyes of our hearts being flooded with light. Lord, we thank you for your word. I ask that your word would be plain and clear. I ask that you would help me to speak plainly and clearly and boldly as I ought to. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 1 and verse 5. Here's a hint of what's to come. He says in verse 5, Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So this is among all nations, which means all ethnic groups. And the objective is obedience to the faith. So again, that's just a little hint of what's to come. Starting in chapter 1 in verse 16. Let's read a couple of verses and this will expand upon that thought we saw in verse 5. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now remember, we're talking about uh, our basic responsibility in the gospel, uh, our basic responsibility in relationships with other people. We're, ta we're still talking about boundaries. Now sometimes in a sentence, or in this case two sentences, uh, the last thought is in re... Uh, is, is, <clears throat> let me say that again. <laughs> the, the last thought is the first reality in time. Let me give an example. Say uh, someone was to say to me, we're going to spend a few days at the beach. You know, it's June here now and summertime and it's the type of thing that people may have in mind. Uh, and then I was to respond, well, that sounds like fun. What beach? And they would say such, such and such a beach, whichever place it was. And I might say, well, that's a bit of a longer drive. Why that beach? And then they might respond, our family has had a beach house there for years. So that's the short conversation that we're using as an example. Now, what I want to point out, though, is the last thought in this conversation. We've had a beach house there for years. The last thought is the first thought in time. It's not the first thought in the conversation, but in time it is because they've had the beach house for years. That's what came first. So the number one is owning the beach house. Number two is therefore choosing to go to the beach where they own the beach house. And then the final thought is, uh, in this case, going for a few days. So the actual sequence in time is opposite to how it was laid out in the conversation. Now this, uh, this is common. It can happen dozens of times a day. It's a normal way of talking uh, is to, to speak in this manner. And it's also true in the Bible too. And it's true certainly in the case that we're looking at in Romans 1 verses 16 and 17. So let's look at it starting from the end. Um, so I'll, instead of verse 16, I'll start in verse 17. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So, uh, as it is written, Old Testament, we're going back to the Old Testament. That's the very last thought in these two uh, verses, but it is the first thought in time. It's going back to where the thought begins, which is an Old Testament writing. And so he quotes from Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, which reads, Behold the proud, uh, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. So that scripture, the just shall live by faith, is quoted three times in the New Testament, here in Romans, also in Galatians, also in Hebrews. Very important New Testament verse from the Old Testament. So, the just shall live by faith. The word live has a double meaning. First of all, it's referring to a manner of living, as in a lifestyle. So, he's saying that the, the 
lifestyle that God is looking for is a lifestyle of faith. Moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, we're conscious of what's happening around us, what God's will is, what it, how we respond to certain circumstances, what we're to do, how we do it by faith. So he's referring to faith as a lifestyle. The just shall live by faith. The second meaning of the word live is uh, referring to quality, uh, as in the abundant life. Jesus said, the thief does not come except uh, to steal and to kill and to destroy. He said, but I have come that you may have life and that, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus is the author of life. It's a quality of life. It's, as he says, it's an abundant life. And so these thoughts are contained in this short little phrase from the Old Testament, the, the just shall live, there will be a lifestyle of faith, and the just shall have an abundance of life because they're living by faith. Now the word faith also has a double application. As Paul goes on to describe in the book of Romans, the only way that you and I or anyone can become just or justified or made righteous is by faith. There is no other way to do it. And so when he says the just shall live by faith, he's, when he just says the word just, that, that already indicates to us faith, the person who's justified by faith. But then the person who's been justified by faith shall also live by faith. And so now um, faith is referring to the justification in the first place, but it's also referring to the lifestyle that follows. So uh, continuing then, uh, in verse 17, we're backing up. We're starting from the end and going to the beginning because that is the uh, sequence in time. That's how we're best going to understand this passage. So as it also says in chapter 1 and verse 17, we go from faith to faith. Now, we've already uh, mentioned that. Faith to faith, the initial faith is the faith that justifies us. And then the faith that we uh, continue with is the faith that we live by. It's our lifestyle. It's the faith that sanctifies us. So we're initially justified and then we continue uh, to be sanctified afterward. To be justified means to be made righteous. So by faith we are made righteous positionally. That's the first faith. We're going from faith to faith. So the first faith is when we're saved, when we're born again, when our sins are forgiven, when we're welcomed into the family of God. Um, that's the first faith, and, and the Bible calls that justification, being made right, and it's a positional uh, uh, thing. We have a position with God. We have a position with God as having never sinned. We have a position with God of uh, being righteous. We have a gift of righteousness that comes from Jesus. Jesus uh, is our substitute. He took what belonged to us, which is all of our sin, in order to give us what belonged to Him, which is righteousness. So it's a gift. So that is the first faith. The second faith uh, is functional righteousness, meaning it's not a position now, it's not a gift, we've already been given those things, um, but it's now a way of living, it's a lifestyle, it's a function. Uh, so this is righteousness. Uh, this is the second kind of righteousness. So the lifestyle of faith produces righteous living, uh, which produces the abundant life. That this is a truth, Old Testament and New, that, that if we can simply be righteous and do righteous things, then there will be a reward, a blessing, a consequence to that. Uh, the abundant life, as we've said. Uh, the, we, the reason why right is right in the Bible is because it works. God is not asking us to do right things, and somehow He has a definition of right things that don't work. You, just naturally speaking, the right thing to do is the thing that works, and that's true also spiritually. The reason why the right things are the right things is they produce the right spiritual results. So being justified by faith is described in the gospel and the lifestyle of faith is described in the gospel. So that's verse 17. Now verse 16, backing up. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So the gospel 
is to the Jew first because they were the people of God in, a, in, a, in an historic sense. They were the historic people of God and it wouldn't be right for them to have been the initial covenant people of God and then now to not tell them about the, this person Jesus who's been prophesied uh, throughout their history uh, to not tell them first. So the gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Gentile and it works equally as we'll see in just a moment, it works equally for Jews and Gentiles. Belief is the essential ingredient for the gospel to work. The just shall live by faith. Uh, so salvation, now we're, we're talking about verse 16, salvation is for everyone who believes. Um, any, any human being, any man, woman, and child who will believe, who will choose to believe, uh, has access to the gospel. It works for all of us. So salvation is for everyone who believes. Just as there are two stages of faith, we go from faith to faith, there are two stages of salvation because faith produces or belief produces salvation. Uh, the first is, uh, the first salvation, is positional righteousness. We spoke about that. That's a result of faith. And then the second salvation is functional righteousness. By, by positional righteousness, we're saved. We're, we're made to be Christians where our sins are forgiven. By, by functional righteousness, we are made holy or we're sanctified. And that also produces a blessing. And that blessing is also called salvation. So uh, this um, second blessing or the second aspect of salvation is sanctification. It's a change in the condition of our heart. By being sanctified, we can do things that, spiritually speaking, we can do things that we uh, could not do before or could not do as well. Let me give an example from 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. Uh, since you have been purified, that's the Greek word hagnizo, which uh, is where we get the word sanctified from. It's from the same word family. Uh, we could say since you've been uh, sanctified or made or purified, uh, which is what, what we read in the New King James, uh, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. So, so these are people that have taken a step of faith. It hasn't been, um, it may not even be their initial impulse to love other people. They may not feel like loving other people. They might be very much tempted to do otherwise. But as a step of faith, because they're conscious of what the Bible is saying, what God is saying to them, they can hear the Holy Spirit reminding them. Uh, because of that, they take a step of faith and they do what really is not their first inclination in many cases to do, which is to love their brethren. And in that step of faith, there is a supernatural flow of the power of God, which is a cleansing thing. It cleanses their heart and it produces holiness or it produces sanctification. And so now, uh, because of the fact that they have taken that step and there's been some cleansing happening, in their heart, it is now easier for them as a matter of uh, first impulse to uh, go ahead and love other people. Uh, so let's read 1 Peter 1 verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, so in other words, since you've loved the brethren, then he says, love one another fervently with a pure heart which sounds redundant. It, it almost sounds like it doesn't quite make sense, but, but that is, he means it exactly as he's written it. He's saying, since you have loved one another, now go ahead and love one another. Uh, now to help explain that, we could l use uh, an illustration from the cripple at Lystra in Acts 14. Not talking about love, but talking about healing, but it'll illustrate the point. And I think some of you have heard this. 
uh, illustration before. There was a cripple at Lystra. He was crippled from his mother's womb. He couldn't walk. Um, he had no strength in his feet. Paul and uh, Silas came. They were preaching the gospel there. The man heard the gospel. The gospel obviously contained a message of healing because in listening to it, the man now had faith to be healed. And so he was he, he had faith to be healed, but he was still crippled. There was uh, n the faith that he had in his heart was producing no results. However, Paul saw that he had faith to be healed and said in a loud voice, stand to your feet feet and then the man as a step of faith stood even though that was not his routine that was not his nature that would not be his first thought he had probably tried to stand countless times he knew he could not stand therefore he no longer tried to stand but he now had faith and Paul said stand upright on your feet and he leaped and walked he was healed his ankle bones his um, the bones in his feet whatever was wrong there there was a change in the condition of his bones and now he could walk so the point being is by faith, he, he walked. He took that first step. He stood to his feet. By faith, he walked in order that he could now walk. And so there is no redundancy. It is, it is a perfect sequence of spiritual reality is to do, one, to do something by faith in order to effect a change so that it's easier for us to continue doing it. Again, the man took a step in order that he could now take steps. And that's precisely what Peter is talking about in 1 Peter 1 22. He says, love one another in order that you may now love one another. So initially we love one another not as a not as, um, as a normal thing. It may be outside of our, our normal routine, at least to begin with. We might have thought of other things to do uh, historically other than to love people. Maybe if they were angry at us, we might be angry at them. If they were impatient with us, we might be impatient with them. If, the, if they said unkind things to us, then our inclination might be to say unkind things to them. But we're talking about taking the initial step out of that former lifestyle into a new lifestyle of righteous living, of doing the right thing. And the power of God is present, just as he was present to heal the cripple at Lystra. He is present to help us to take that step. And that step is a sanctifying step. It is a cleansing step. It is a, it is a, it affects, it impacts our heart. It changes the condition of our heart. It makes us, makes it easier for us from our heart to now continue to do the right thing. And the Bible calls this salvation. Now, this is not the salvation, as you know, I think you know, this is not the salvation of the our initial step of salvation, of being born again, of having our sins forgiven, of being welcomed into the family of God. But this is an ongoing uh, salvation. This is uh, an experience it's a deepening and a furthering of our experience in God it isn't becoming a Christian as it was in the first case but it's now the lifestyle of a Christian this is what Paul's been talking about in verses 16 and 17 going from faith to faith and because salvation is from faith we're going from one aspect of salvation to another aspect of salvation so salvation uh, can only work by the power of God, just as the cripple at Lystra could only be healed by the power of God. So salvation, so sanctification can only work by the power of God. Uh, the gospel, Paul says in Romans 1.16, is the power of God. Therefore, uh, not only does the gospel contain the message of the new birth, how to be born again, but the gospel also contains literally, as you know, dozens and dozens of instructions. And these instructions are not just telling us what to do. They are that contained in each um, instruction is the power to do what the instruction says. The gospel, as Paul says here, uh, is the power of God. So if God says to husbands, love your wives, that's not just telling us what to do. It's imparting to us, to an open heart, a receptive heart, a believing heart. It is imparting to us the ability to love our wives. Or as I say, there's numerous, there's dozens of different examples we could give from the New Testament. And, and as we go through the process of, by faith, stepping out and with the power of God, doing what the Bible says, uh, we are being sanctified, or another way of saying it is we are being saved in the second aspect of salvation. This is what 
Paul is talking about in Romans 1 verses 16 and 17. Therefore, because the gospel is the power of God, uh, Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel. So now we've worked backwards from the end of verse 17 to the to the beginning of verse 16. And so then to restate what Paul is saying in these two verses is he's saying that the gospel, um, <clears throat> Paul's not ashamed of the gospel because, now we're, there's two aspects to the gospel. Uh, by the way, the gospel is the entirety of the New Testament. It is, it is the first verse of Matthew to the last verse of Revelation. Um, within that, there is the specific gospel of how to get born again, but in, in broader terms, uh, all of the verses, all of the truth of the New Testament is also the gospel because, again, we, the gospel has these two aspects to it. Faith has two aspects. Salvation has two aspects. And so, uh, so just... Um, for the sake of time right now, focusing in on the second aspect. So this is in addition to the new birth. Paul is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because when it is believed, it is the power of God. It's the power of God that produces righteous living in us, that produces the abundant life in us, which is also called salvation. Praise God. So, so already, here we are just in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, and we've... Uh, Already, Paul has announced what his entire letter is about. Not just what his entire letter is about, but what the entire New Testament is about. This is, this is the gospel. This is the power of God. This is salvation. This is not only how to become a Christian, but it's how to live day by day, more than day by day, how to live moment by moment. And so this righteous living is also called love. They're, they're perfectly synonymous terms. To do the right thing is to love one another. To love one another is to do the right thing. It's what the New Testament teaches us to do. So love, now we're talking again about boundaries and we're talking particularly about our central responsibility in the whole world of boundaries. And so therefore that one basic responsibility, one essential responsibility we have is to love one another. And as I mentioned earlier, as we go through the New Testament book by book, this basic truth is emphasized over and over and over and over again without exaggeration. Now, let's just continue in the book of Romans and just see how Paul continues to expand upon what he just said. Now in chapter 2, just a, a few verses later, chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, but in accordance with, now he's speaking to a particular um, listening group here, which uh, we hope is not you, uh, so don't take this personally unless it applies, uh, but in a, accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now, for most of us, we're just going to hook up with this verse in that very last word, God, now verse 6, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Verse 7, now listen, this is so fascinating to listen to. Uh, imagine that that our concept of the gospel is narrow, accurate, but narrow. And by narrow, I mean just only referring to the gospel, salvation, faith. What if those words in our heart and mind only meant the new birth? And thank God if that was the case. Um, because to be saved is infinitely better than not to be saved. To understand salvation as far as the new birth goes is infinitely better than to not understand it. To have it, obviously, is better than understanding it. It's, uh, that means we have eternal life. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that being said, there is so much more to the gospel other than simply being saved. There is a lifestyle that we live day by day, hopefully for decades and multiple decades, where we can, where we can live with and walk with and serve God. Praise the Lord. Uh, so, uh, but imagine for a moment that, that we were just, uh, instead of the broader understanding of faith and salvation and the gospel, say we were limited to the narrower uh, understanding of it, and then we were to read these verses. Um, these verses would not quite make sense to us because Paul goes on to say here in chapter 2 and verse 7, eternal life is to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Hmm. 
Now, if I have an understanding, a correct understanding of the gospel, but limited to simply the new birth, that's not going to make sense because the first thing I would want to say is um, uh, <clears throat> salvation or eternal life does not come from patient continuance in doing good. I would say emphatically that is not the case. I would say eternal life comes from confessing Jesus as my Lord. Again, which is true, but Paul is speaking in the broader sense now. The second aspect of salvation, uh, which does come to those, eternal life, the life of God, the abundant life of God, does come to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. In verse 8, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, to them is going to be indignation and wrath. Verse 9, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who uh, does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. Again, now verse 10, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good. This is, we're talking about eternal life. We're talking about an aspect of eternal life. We're talking about an aspect of salvation. This is what faith does. This is the gospel, the broader aspect of the gospel. I trust that I've been clear that you understand perfectly what I'm talking about. Um, continuing in verse 10, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God between Gentile and, and Jew. There is no distinction in God's eyes now. So we're still talking about boundaries. Uh, central to the idea of boundaries is that we each have a responsibility. We each have a territory or a property. And, and this, this space that we've been given represents our basic responsibility in life. And our territory is to live righteously, which would mean to love one another. The gospel is the power of God to live righteously. Uh, again, Anything God says not only contains the instruction, but also contains the power to do the instruction. It's the power of God to live righteously or the power of God to love. Now, this love determines the course of our life. It determines our outcome in life. And by it, according to chapter 2 and verse 10 of Romans, we receive glory, honor, and peace. Praise God. And we're talking about in this life. In eternity, certainly, but also in this life. This is part of what uh, abundant life is. It's part of what salvation is, is we receive glory, honor, and peace. And how does it come? It comes by living righteously. Let's continue in Romans. We'll just look at three more verses, three more uh, short passages. And it'll be about Paul just taking this thought that he's started in chapter 1 and seeing how he repeats it uh, throughout the book of Romans. So we've looked in chapter 1, chapter 2. We'll look in chapter 6, verses 22 to 23. But now having been set free from sin, this is, we've already been saved. We've already, um, already been made righteous. So now we're going on, we're going from faith to faith. Like Paul said, we're going on to the second aspect of faith, second aspect of salvation. Uh, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness. Clearly it's speaking about our lifestyle and the end everlasting life. And so life again is being described in terms as a consequence of the right lifestyle. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So again, we're talking about eternal life. That's Romans 6, Romans 8 and verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Speaking of spiritual death, speaking to Christians, um, if you live according to the flesh. So these are people that are already saved, already made righteous, already have their sins forgiven, already are, are children of God already are in the family of God but he says to to those of us that are in that category he says if you live according to the flesh you will die but if by the Spirit so again the, the gospel is the power of God by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live again speaking about um, the life of God the abundant life of God the eternal life of God which by the way isn't just for after we die but eternal life 
kicks in the moment we're saved. So in this present life, although this present life living in these mortal bodies is not eternal, we still can enjoy eternal life while living in these mortal bodies. That life will continue on into eternity. He says, but if you, by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And then finally in Romans 12, verses 1 to 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Normally, it wouldn't be reasonable <laughs> to ask somebody to give so much, to, to sacrifice ourselves, to make our bodies a living sacrifice. Um, th that is asking for everything that we have. However, God has given us everything He has. Jesus has died on the cross for us. He has His own Son uh, has died as a substitute for us uh, and paid the price for us in order that we could have eternal life. This is the nature of blood covenant. It's, it's, a, it's like a marriage. It, ideally in a marriage, everything that belongs to the husband belongs to the wife and everything that belongs to the wife belongs to the husband. Each one gives themselves wholly to the other. And so this is now a reasonable sacrifice for us to make, doubly so because of the benefit that we receive from doing it. We receive salvation or abundant life, salvation in the second aspect of what we mean by salvation. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, so this transformation, this change, this, ch this ongoing change in the condition of our heart. We spoke about this when we were reading from 1 Peter, where 1 Peter was talking about, okay, you love, have loved one another. Now, because you have loved one another, now therefore go and love one another. There's been a change in the condition of the heart that permits a fuller, freer expression of love. And this is the transformation that Paul is speaking of here in Romans uh, chapter 12. You've been transformed by the renewing of your mind, and that is that we now view uh, our, our, our sacrifice to God as being reasonable. It's our reasonable service, so our mind is being renewed to think that this is a reasonable way, a normal way of living, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so again, uh, that's going to be God's perfect will for us, not just in eternity, but for in this life. Earlier, we read about how we receive glory, honor, and peace. And that is part of His good and acceptable, His perfect will for us is to enjoy these things. So we're talking about boundaries. In particular, we're talking about identifying what falls to us, what falls within our boundary lines. The boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places, it says in the Old Testament for us. We've got a good responsibility. We've been enabled, we've been empowered through the gospel to perform that responsibility. That is just the one thing. So if there's one thing that we can take away from our message today, Today. Same thing that we wanted you to take away last week. It is this. It is, is that there's a simplicity to the gospel that, that it all distills down. It all boils down to one key thought. That key thought is repeated multitudes of times from beginning to end of the New Testament is that God is asking us to trust Him, to believe Him. The gospel is the power of God to those who believe that we would believe in His Word, believe in His instructions, that we would do it, that we would be righteous, we would live righteously, not just have the gift of righteousness, but then live righteously, that we would love one another, and that we would have the many benefits that come from it. Not only do we enjoy benefits, but it also makes us effective ministers, because that is the basis of ministry. Paul says to the Galatians in chapter 5, by love serve one another, or by love minister to one another, be ministers. We're all called to be ministers in that sense. And so our ministry, there's two things that happen when we uh, walk in love, is we become effective ministers, we become disciples, we're makers of disciples, we're, uh, we're fulfilling the Great Commission, we're doing what God asked us to do, we're living powerful lives, fruitful lives, and then also we're being blessed um, in our efforts. Praise God. So, 
again, we trust that this has been a, a fruitful time, a useful time, a time well spent for you. Again, I want to thank you for joining us today. We, we are blessed that you're with us. You're part of this community that is growing in the personality and the character of Jesus Christ. You're part of God's army around the world that is doing His will. And you're demonstrating uh, His blessing and His benefit in so doing. Uh, Father, let me pray for you, Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice right now that you would uh, speak to us. If there's anybody here that has yet to become a Christian, who's yet to take that first step of faith, who's yet to become righteous as a gift, um, I pray that you would just uh, uh, compel them in their heart right now, that, that now is the time. If that's you, if, if that is you, that you've, you've, this is the first time you've heard this message or you've never acted on this message before, just say after me, say right out loud. And, and this, is, this is where, just so you know in advance, before we pray, what this is about is when you say these words and you say them from your heart, it means you're going to step into righteousness as a gift, where what Jesus, the lifestyle He lived, the, the value of that is given to you as a gift, as if you never sinned. Your sins will be forgiven, and you will be in a righteous position with God. Uh, if you would like that, and in fact, it's even beyond liking it, you may like it, but it's even beyond that, you need it. Uh, you need it for this life. You need it to be blessed in this life. You need it to enter into heaven and eternity. If you want that, please say after me, say, uh, Say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe God raised you from the dead. And you're alive right now. And I invite you to be my Lord. I invite you to be the Lord of my life. I will follow you. I need you. I need salvation. I need forgiveness of sin. So I invite you to be my personal Savior and my personal Lord right now. And I thank you for it. So I'm going to continue to pray right now for, for all of us. And, and Father, I, I pray for all of us that you would um, encourage us and strengthen us and, and help us to live out fully the gospel, uh, live out fully the salvation that you provided for us, uh, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you again next week.